I'm Richard Gerhart, founder of Gerhart Law, a full-service intellectual property law firm specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhart, not an attorney, but I work at Gerhart Law doing the marketing, and I have my own businesses too. Welcome to Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship, where we talk with small businesses, entrepreneurs, and discuss the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Today, we have a very special guest, Chris Miles. He's the anti-financial advisor, and he's got a lot of great advice for you. And then we have two great presenters. The first is Anne McKittrick, and she taught child development to college students and knows a lot about kids and raising kids from a lot of different roles that she held. So she's going to talk to us about parenting and her podcast, Parenting in the First Three Years. So <laughs> I think we could all use some help with that. <laughs> and then we have John York. Or remind us of all the mistakes we made. He's one of the two. <laughs> John York with the Frequency People app. So this is pretty cool. You know that you can monetize if you're a podcaster or an influencer on these various platforms. Well, John gives you a chance to monetize on your own hub and keep more of what you make than a lot of these other places do. So that sounds great. I can hardly wait. But before we get to our distinguished guests, it's time for IP in the news. And today we're going to be talking about patents. And if you're interested in learning more about patents, you can go to our landing page and download some free content. It's called learnmoreaboutpatents.com. Very straightforward. But the patent that we're talking about today is, drum roll, another Apple patent. Application. They haven't it's, the well, patent yet. That's true. It's an application, but it's uh, still the general class of intellectual property is, is, is patents. And what they are planning to do is put motion sensors around phones so that the phone can interpret your lip movements and then provide more information for different things like improving speech recognition, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, so this was from an article on the register online by Brandon Bigliario. Berlo. <laughs> That's how we think you say we, it. We practiced this before the show. Bigliario. <laughs> yeah, something. And the title of his article is Read Lips. Siri wants to feel them, according to Fresh Apple patent application. <laughs> so I think this is a great uh, example of how technology is continuing to get more and more personal. It's just like, okay, they hear what you say, they follow where you go, and now they're picking up your lip movements. I mean, really, this is I pretty amazing. Movements too, though, right? Yeah, I guess if you move your head or you stand up quickly, all of that is going to be taken into your phone and regurgitated for some purposes as of yet unknown. Well, right. It says in order to match vibrations and head movements to certain words, Apple said it would need to either train a small sample of words akin to how Siri is trained on a new iDevice and rely on a generalized corpus of similar data from other users or would need a considerable amount of data from users who would likely need to be listening for quite a while in order to pair sensor readings with audio signals. So they still are struggling with how to collect the data to make sure that they get the right thing. So I can just see this thing. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, I, I Siri in my phone, I, well, we don't use Siri. My phone is always like, what did you say? I didn't catch that. Did you want to go to McDonald's? I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah, right. If it reads your lips and you're like, okay, well, yeah, we're, we're sending you to a fast food restaurant. Anyway, um, it's one more step closer to domination by our tech overlords. And I'd like to get our guest's opinion on this new technology. Uh, welcome, Chris Miles, uh, who's a cash flow expert and an anti-financial advisor. Uh, thanks for being here. What is your opinion on this Apple patent? Well, it definitely brings a new topic to uh, you know, a whole new meaning to George Bush's read my lips, no new taxes, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> maybe we should have read his lips instead of just listening to his words. We would have gotten something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great That's point. A <laughs> Anne, Anne McCormick, what do you, uh, McKittrick, Anne McKittrick, what do you have to say about this? You know, there's two things that come to mind when I think about Siri reading lips of someone who's handling the phone. And that is what's going to happen with your, when your toddler picks up your phone or your, even your 12 month old puts it in their mouth or, you know, just how babies will take a phone and play with it. And um, I wonder in their, design of this uh, application, if they are taking that into consideration, the difference between 
the way a child might be playing with the phone versus the way an older person would actually be using the phone. I can just see red flags going off at <laughs> Apple now. Oh, alert, alert, alert. <laughs> child data, child data coming in, right? <laughs> right, yeah. The other thought I have is just that, you know, the children of today, those who are born this year, what in the world is their future looking like if this is happening today? You know, like, will they have any any privacy whatsoever? Will everything that they do be read and interpreted and analyzed? Well, that certainly seems to be the direction we're going. And um, <clears throat> as uh, Elizabeth Olpin points out, the people who run these companies aren't elected, right? right. And so, yeah. uh, you know, as as a population, we don't really have much control over what they do. We don't do. have a say in who's running this. Yeah. yeah. So, John, welcome to the show. What are your thoughts? I go back and forth on this. I mean, we already give up so much of ourselves to technology just out of convenience so, I mean, they already are, I, I, you know, they're already listening to certain things that we say anyway. So, I mean, hey, Siri, you know, how do they know that you're saying, hey, Siri? But I also could see some really good use cases of this. I mean, imagine being in a library or church or somewhere where you're not supposed to be able to speak loud and you can just word the lips and be able to send a text message to somebody without even having to speak out loud. Um, so I, I do see the convenient side of it, but it's a little scary as well, knowing the type of information that they're going to be gathering from us. Sure. I mean, it's a double-edged sword and uh, sometimes you have a bad cell phone connection, right? So if this technology could yeah. somehow be translated and uh, your voice could be communicated more effectively because of a bad line or something, maybe, maybe there's value there, right? Yeah. What do you think? What do I think? I think I can't imagine what's coming down the pike. I'm with Anne. It's like, good heavens, our poor children and grandchildren. And I don't know if this will actually develop into anything. It sounds like it's pretty early days and they haven't thought a lot of things through and there's a lot more research that needs to be done on it. So who knows? The world may move on to something else. I don't know. Well, I guess only time will tell. So, uh, And if you want to learn more about patents, go to learnmoreaboutpatents.com. And you can get more details about protecting your invention. So I'd like to start the interviews today. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Chris Miles. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a cash flow expert and he's an anti-financial advisor. So he's a leading authority teaching entrepreneurship and professionals how to get their money working for them today. And he's an author and podcast host of the Money Ripples podcast and has been featured in US News, CNN, Money, Entrepreneur, On Fire, and Bigger Pockets, and has a proven reputation with his company, Money Ripples, for getting clients fast financial results. So welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, I did have a chance to look at your website and uh, your videos. They're very inspiring. And I certainly recommend that anybody who is interested in learning to manage their money better uh, you know, check out your 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 website. Um, but why do you call yourself the anti uh, financial advisor? Oh, pretty much because I think financial advisors suck, or to say it pretty bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good hearted people, of course. But uh, but I used to be one, you know, 20 years ago. And I didn't start out that way. I mean, I was raised like a lot of us were right. I was raised by good parents taught me good values. You know, my mom was a was an artist. She was trained by the same master painter that trained Bob Ross. You know, so she taught me about following your dreams and your passions. While my dad was more the secure job, you know, you get good grades, you get that great job, and then eventually, you know, your life is happily ever after, right? Um, however, in his life, it wasn't that way because uh, although he was very much of that generation that was very loyal to their employers, employers weren't always loyal to him. He created a lot of stress, and uh, he even had strokes in his 40s and, his, and heart attacks mm -hmm. in his 50s, mm -hmm. um, and he thought that work would literally kill him. And when it came to money, he was always teaching about things like, you know, we can't afford this. Money doesn't grow on trees. You know, what do you think I am made of money? You know, very much that depression era mentality. And that influenced me to the point where I said, you know, I want something different. And so when I went to college, I was going to become a business consultant, but I figured if I was going to do that, I should have real life business experience. So I actually with one class to go before I got my bachelor's, I said, before I go get my MBA, let's get some real life experience so I can kind of build my resume more before I get out of college. So I took a sabbatical and I ended up looking for some business to start. I wasn't sure what that was. 
But the first one that came up months later that intrigued me was a financial advisor. Uh, I didn't know they would take anybody off the street that basically could pass the test with 70% and didn't have a criminal record. I didn't realize that it was that easy to become a financial advisor. Wow. Um, but I did it and did that for several years. Loved being an entrepreneur, loved being on my own and having that, you know, control my time and my freedom and things like that. Um, but what shocked me was when my dad called me up and said, Chris, when are you going to advise me? Which was interesting because the tables had turned because he was always the one giving me advice of spend nothing, be a tightwad, which he really was. Uh, he would steal, you know, little salt and pepper shakers from Chinese restaurants that they didn't didn't give him oh, good no, enough service, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> well, and, I just, you know, I would just say, I, I mean, I grew up with my 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 parents were the same way. They were depression area depression era uh, parents, and they were always very concerned about scarcity and always worried about the next financial crisis. And but, as Elizabeth can testify, it really made they made their mark on me because i had a lot of those you know bad habits um and you know sort of the save 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 thing which is great but the whole problem is is that at some point uh you never enjoy the money that you make because you're worried about not having enough for the future so i guess one question right. would be is like what is the right balance between saving and spending you know, that's a good point because that was kind of my problem too. I, I found out I was following in his footsteps, right? Um, and it was hard because, I mean, he he did he would spend a little bit of things, right? But it was always in an effort to save and, every, you know, just really hoard money is what he was doing. Right. But when I remember sitting down with him, you know, he I looked at his finances. I said, Dad, even though you've paid off your house, you're debt-free, and you saved in your 401ks, got the match and everything, if you retire today at 61 years old, you better hope you die in five years because that's when you'll run out of money. Wow. And wow. he said, well, what do I do? And I said, well, you did everything right. I don't know because I can't give you any more advice than what you did. This is all what we, this is what we teach as financial advisors. And I found out that I was on that same path, right? I was trying to save everything, spend nothing. I was turning off the AC in the summertime, turning off the heat in the winter, you know, so that my family hated me. You know, and all in an effort to try to save and accumulate all this money to hopefully retire someday. And it became an epiphany to me because I realized that it wasn't just me. My clients were in the same position. Even the retired ones still worried about running out of money. And then even financial advisors. This is where it re really got me was all the financial advisors you should have, should have it figured out. None of them were financially free off of the actual investments they did. They were all making money off the commissions, but not the investments. Mm -hmm. And that woke me up. And and you and you get you're right. You got to find that balance between spending and saving, right? So um, what, and so what do you do if you don't if you're not saving? Then how do you plan for the future, right? So is it's it, about it's, it's, stewardship, is really what it's about, right? Um, is the savers understand that someone who's in save saver mentality, they're usually in scarcity. When you have scarcity, when you're always feeling like there's never enough, there's always lack. Right, you can never save enough. You can never pay off your debt fast enough, which is that saver mentality. Think of Dave Ramsey. That is the ultimate scarcity bondage mentality with it being a saver. If you have that mentality, what will happen is that you'll never have enough. You will never be free financially. On the flip side, we all know it's spenders. It's always easy come, easy go. You know, it's you're always having to hustle to get more money to then spend it. You're also in scarcity. You never have freedom. The truth is in the middle. It's a steward. A steward takes the best of a spender and a saver. And puts it into one because money is meant to be used, but money is meant to be used not just to hoard it and to squirrel it away like you're waiting for winter, but instead it's meant to be used to create more with it. It's be meant to be used to improve and to multiply it, to use it to help bless and edify more people's lives. That's the real purpose of money because the truth is we come with nothing and we die with nothing, right? Everything in between stewardship. You know, even if you think you can be buried with your money. No one cares. Nobody's going to put on your tombstone how much you're worth. On you know, nobody's going to say you were worth two point three million dollars. And oh yeah, and you're a loving <laughs> husband and father. You know, no one cares, <laughs> right? And even in the Egyptians. Signs above our graves, but I guess <laughs> not. That's probably not going to work out. Thanks, I want to ask. Yeah. You. So first mm -hmm. of all, I felt for a long time that men are, money is energy. And yes. as long as you have your personal energy, you can always get more money somehow. So and money flows through the world as energy, really, because the symbols we use to represent it don't really mean anything if there isn't something behind it and not even gold. It's our personal energy. But the other thing 
that I saw on this list of questions that we could ask you that our assistant prepared was what are some alternative investments? Like what are some things that people wouldn't think of that would help them? And I know that you're a big one on passive income and real estate and stuff. So what are some other investments that people can do? Yeah, that's, that's where you have to bridge the gap, right? Um, you have to get yourself out of that accumulation mindset where you're trying to hoard and store away money and then hopefully live on less than the interest. And instead of how to get that money flowing, right? That's why they call it cash flow. Mm -hmm. It's how do we get that money flowing and moving? Anything that flows brings life. Blood flows, you live. Water flows, there's life. Money flows, there can also be life too. And so what I realized is after I was a financial advisor, realized it wasn't working, I quit. I vowed never to go back. I was going to be a mortgage broker and teach ballroom dancing on the side. A uh, little known fact, I was one of the nation's top amateur ballroom dancers at the time. Well, and so that was going to be my thing. Uh, but while I was doing that, I was learning from other people. And you mentioned like real estate investing is an alternative investment, right? Most people think that you should just be throwing money in the stock market in mutual funds or your, your Fidelity 401k or whatever it might be. The problem is it just has not worked. It's been proven not to work. In fact, even Fidelity came out with their statistics Less than 1% of their 401k clients have over a million dollars. And even if you have a million dollars, a financial advisor will only say, pull off 3%. That's 30,000 a year, which you just can't live on, right? So the success rate is very, very low. It's really like, really, if, if you look at it, it's like less than a half percent. If anybody had that, think of any business owner. If they had a, you know, out of their star reviews, they had a, you know, a really one, you know, one out of 200 gave them a five-star review, you would probably not do business with them. That's what it's like with financial advising. So oh, when I started doing the alternative path, this is what got me to be able to retire when I was 28 years old after leaving being a financial advisor was doing things that are outside of what financial advisors offer you because they can only offer mutual funds and insurances. That's it. That's all they're licensed to do. And I know I was one of them. This is what you can do instead though. You can do alternative investments. So like real estate investing, but not like the stuff in your backyard. I'm not saying just buy a property at random. There are companies out there called turnkey real estate companies, for example, where you can buy a property anywhere across the country. Because I live in the Western half of the United States. Properties out here are horrible. There are bad rentals out here. But if I go to the Midwest or Southeast, I can find a property where I can easily make at least a 10% rate of return on just the cash that I put into the property, not including any appreciation or tax benefits or anything else, just by getting my money to work for me there. Um, so turnkey real estate that means that a company finds the property for you. It's already rent ready. Mm -hmm. They do all the property management for you. Everything's done for you. You're hands off on that property. So Chris, though, so that's just it doesn't, one. does it, does it, I, those sound like great ideas, but don't, I mean, it takes money to invest in, in real estate, right? You have to have a, you have to have like, I don't know, 50 or $75,000, right. To put into a real estate. Generally investment. at least 30 or 40,000. Yeah. Right. Uh, but I would say this is that most people, if they don't have at least $100,000, I wouldn't be investing in these things anyways. Um, you should be in right now, especially with the recession, really, it's looming around the corner. We all know it. You know, Even though they all say it's over, we're in the clear, we all know that there's something else coming, right? Something hasn't added up with what the government's been saying. So that being said, you should have more cash reserves sitting on the side that you don't invest. You know, That would be a safer way to go. A wise stewardship of your money is to keep at least minimum six to 12 months of your monthly expenses. Then so as an that, entrepreneur though, how can you do that? So like this shows directed toward entrepreneurism. So you need money to make money. We all know that. Mm -hmm. And as an entrepreneur, you take a big risk because you're spending money and you're hoping you'll get the payback soon. So how does entrepreneurism fit into your strategy? Well, let's question that. Like, does it really take money to make money? Because I mean, it is easy from the investing perspective. It's an easy way to do it. But think about it. We were all at one point broke students. We had no money. How did we ever make money? We did it because this is the key thing I learned before I became you know, financially free where I was able to retire when I was 28 is that the real principle here is that dollars follow value, right? Dollars follow the value that you create for another individual or group of people. So, I mean, right now we're on this show. I mean, we got John, we've got Ann here. We got all of us here, here to create value for this audience. Why? Because we know that when we give value, often value comes back in some form or another, right? It's that karma. When you go and try to give people what they want, try to give them something that serves them, it solves a problem in such a way that they want to exchange money for that service or for that, off that option, whatever it might be, that's when you make more money. 
When I learned that, and even though I was a financial advisor, I did not understand that. I just thought it took money to make money. But when I understand that was value creation is where the real economic engine is, especially when you're a business owner, when you figure that out, everything becomes formulaic. Everything becomes very predictable and easy. That is how you create money. Then, of course, and here's the key thing too with businesses, and this is the name of the show, right? Talking about passage of profits. The one thing that most business owners make a mistake doing is that they keep, quote unquote, reinvesting into their business, right? They take their cash, put it back in. If you're always reinvesting all of your money back in your business, you are not a profitable business because you're just spending money. Now, it might build up more revenue. You might actually be growing that revenue, but if there's never any profit, who cares, right? What's the real <laughs> benefit? I agree 100%. <laughs> but I do think, though, as a business owner, so I, I had before we uh, took a flyer on Gearheart Law, I used to work for mm -hmm. big companies and, uh, you know, collected my salary and everything else. And then one day Elizabeth said, well, why don't you go start your own practice? And, he, you know, here we are almost uh, 20 years later. And I, I will say for the benefit of our audience that your frame of mind really does switch when you're in the process, when you're working as a business owner, because now you're seeing your spending more as an investment um, you know, as opposed to an expense. So if I spend more money on marketing, you know, I'm expecting a return. I'm going to get more, more business. We'll have more customers, clients, and then in theory, we'll have, you know, more profit. Uh, and it's, right. it's really a much different kind of mindset than, you know, collect your paycheck and then try to figure out what to do with it. So, I always think that if people have the energy and the desire, they should try a side hustle or something if they are employed by a company, whether it's real estate investment or converting a hobby or something, just you didn't get a sense of like, you know, this is how money can really work for you, right? As opposed to being a, I agree. a, a you know, passive investor. So, um, yeah. yeah, you know, it's, so, it's, it's amazing. So Chris, how did you get to retire at a young age? What did you do with your money? Was it real estate? Was it a bunch of different things? It was a combination of the two, the very two things you guys were just mentioning, right? Um, I did do real estate investing, which helped add additional streams of passive income. But I also almost accidentally, I found out a way to create residual or passive income in my own business. Um, so for example, I mentioned I was a mortgage broker. And I remember one of my friends who was a millionaire, he was asking me, he said, Chris, if money were no issue, would you keep doing mortgages? Would you stay in this business? And I said, well, if money were no issue in my life, I'm like, I like teaching about it, but I absolutely despise and hate paperwork. You know, I, I just, I can't stand it. I mean, I know there might be some, some attorneys out there that love paperwork, but I'm not one of those people, right? <laughs> and so I said, no, I don't want that. And uh, he said, well, why don't you find somebody who does like doing it? I said, is there somebody that's that some nerd out there that actually likes doing paperwork? He said, I promise you there is. So I remember going to the owner of that brokerage and I asked him, I said, is there somebody that fits this description inside of our company? He said, yes, talk to Clark. So I went to Clark and I said, Clark, listen, if I basically just teach these people about the mortgage, how they can you know, leverage the equity for their house to be able to invest and make more with it. These people are excited. They want to get a mortgage. Would you be willing to do the mortgage for them? And he said, yes. And because I was mortgage licensed, I said, would you be willing to split it 50-50? And he said, yes. If I don't have to find them, you just serve them up on a silver platter. I'll do that all day long. So I, I, I would have just random questions. I'd even really promote my business as a mortgage broker. It was just friends and family, just people coming to me. And then referrals of those people just saying, hey, I hear you guys do some cool things with mortgages. And I would tell them, yeah, this is what you can do with your mortgage. You can refi, free up cash flow. You can even invest it and make and get your mortgage payment essentially paid for by investments. Um, people were like, that's great. Where do I go? I would say, talk to Clark. And I would do that. And about a month or two later, I see a check for like a thousand or 2000 bucks. And I said, oh my goodness, that was easy. I spent a half hour talking to somebody and then checks just keep coming in the mail. And, and I, I, I took that. I was like, well, I can do this with other places. What do other people ask me for? Where are people looking for answers or referrals? And so I remember there's a, a, a wholesale jeweler in Salt Lake City that would charge you a third of the cost for like your engagement rings and things like that. And I was in my twenties. So that was like everybody. So people would say, yeah, I'm going to get engaged. I'm like, well, don't buy it over here. Buy a ring over here. It's appointment only. They'll save you like a third, 
you know, it would be like a third of the cost. And they would do that, and I would get a check in the mail. And pretty soon between that, and then I have my real estate investments and lending out money and doing rentals and things like that, the next thing I know, I'm making like $5,000 a month when my expenses at that time were $3,500 a month because I only had you know, a few young kids at the point at that point. And, uh, and I, was, I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm spending only a couple hours a week, and I'm, I don't have to do anything else. <laughs> like, I'm good. I can quit any other profession I have. And that's really how I did it so quickly. I could have just done money. But the key thing is I was always asking, obsessing over that question, how can I create a win-win? How can I serve people or help answer questions for them? So and Chris, that's where I, those I, ideas were able to pop up from. Yeah. Can I ask you, so would you consider that a form of affiliate marketing? Because I know I've looked at affiliate marketing a little bit for other things, not for the law firm, because there are such strict rules, but with affiliate mm -hmm. marketing, don't you have people's links on your website and if people buy it by going to your website and finding them you get some money for it you could do that i mean this was pre affiliate marketing type of stuff right i mean even what i was doing was like the four hour work week before tim Ferriss wrote the four hour work week right um and that's really what it is i mean it is like affiliate marketing but remember i didn't i didn't have a website at all mm -hmm. um i didn't have anything online this was purely just word of mouth i mean this was really just people that i knew in fact, when people ask me, what do you do? I, I didn't know how to describe it to them at the time because I was like, well, I do real estate investing. I'm a mortgage broker, but I'm not doing any of the mortgage brokering like I was doing in the past. Um, I'm really just referring it on to basically like a partner, right? And and so when people would ask me, well, what do you do? I'd say, well, I sell drugs. Like, <laughs> I just, I had to buy myself time to try to formulate an answer because I didn't know what to call that. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. It's like affiliate marketing, but remember that was very organic. I wasn't forcing it. Like some affiliate marketers would do where they'll just pimp out anything. That's not what I was doing. I was literally just, people were asking common questions. And if people were always asking for the same thing, I would say, all right, people are wanting this. How can I connect them with it? If it's not me, then who? And right. so that's really how it became very organic for me. Right. And so we have to take a break. Uh, we're speaking with Chris Miles and he's the cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor will be back with more Passage to Profit right after this. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our guest today, Chris Miles, the cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor. If you want to make money, listen to Chris. So Chris, <laughs> Let's start. Well, I'm list, I'm all ears, right? <laughs> let's let's dive right, <laughs> in, <laughs> right into passive income. So what is passive income? Passive income is income that comes in without you having to work it for it, you know, exchange time for money, that sort of thing. So and it's just a continuous income stream, right? That you can hopefully rely on with really a minimum amount of maintenance, right? So what are some forms of passive income? That's right. It, go off of what Warren Buffett says. If you don't make money while you sleep, you'll work until you die. And I think yeah. every entrepreneur needs passive income. I mean, even if you have your income stream coming from your business, which is your main investment, your economic engine, still you want to pull those profits from the business, not leave it all in. Take some of those profits and move it elsewhere so you can have multiple streams of these passive income coming in, regardless if there's shutdowns because you're non-essential business like we had happen back in 2020 or anything else that might happen in life. You want to make sure you have those passive streams of income coming in. So this is where you get your money working harder for you. Get them to be your employees getting out there to work. So I mentioned before, there's things like turnkey real estate where you buy the property, but you don't have to find it. Somebody else finds it for you. They'll manage it for you. Everything's done for you that way. Um, that I would kind of say is semi-passive. But then there's things you could do like where you could become like the bank. You know, most people don't realize there's investors out there that you don't have to be the active investor. You don't have to know a lot about real estate investing, for example, to be investing in real estate. For example, there are plenty of real estate investors out there that, that have so many opportunities, they just don't have enough capital to be able to do them all. And so they might borrow money from you at, say, 10, 12, sometimes even up to 15% a year, borrow that money from you to use it, and then 6 to 12 months later, pay it back, and then you can do that again. So there's lots of ways to make money with your money that way. Uh, even in the oil and gas space, I've got investments there where if we're going to have to pay more at the gas pumps, I might as well profit off of it. You know, So right. there's there's ways you can actually lease the land to oil companies because oil companies don't want to own the land. They just want to work it. They just want to drill the land and use it. But you can actually do that 
not just get paid the lease from the land, but also you get paid from the oil drilling, but also the natural gas, which by the way is the clean energy. That's the natural byproduct of the oil drilling they get. They also get natural gas off of it. So you can get paid royalties and get paid on the rent of the land as well. So there's lots of things there. There's even self-storage, there's apartments, there's raw land. You can actually make money off that. I mean, I invested about a quarter million dollars and that's now paying me $7,500 a month You know that I don't have to work for. I have partners doing the work for me. So there's so just Chris, so yeah. many ways you can do it that a financial advisor will never tell you because either one, they don't know about it, which is mostly the mm -hmm. true the time, well, try, true most of the time, mm -hmm. or two, they don't want you to know about it because they don't make a commission off of telling you about those things. So Chris, where do people find these uh, opportunities? What's that? I mean, if so I let's say I do have some extra money. I'd like to go more towards sort of like the the non-traditional investments like you've been talking about. How do I find these investments? Uh, is it just a matter of looking on the internet or uh, word of mouth? Are there p particular people that you you would want to interview? How does it work? Yeah, you do one of two ways. I mean, you could definitely do it like what I did in the beginning, which I spent over the last almost 20 years doing, which is, you know, finding those people, right? Getting introduced to them. You know, you can Google search or do whatever. Um, but just know this is that even if you can find them on Google, it doesn't mean that they're good, right? Google doesn't equal good when it comes to finding investors because sometimes the best investors aren't very good marketers themselves, right? They're just good investors. They do what they do. They, they've been through... 20 plus years of, of their experience going through the thick and thin, the ups and the downs, the recessions and whatnot. And still they come out on the other side stronger, you know, and that's, those are the kind of people I look for. So you can either find those people yourself, which could take years to do, or you get involved with a community that might already have those people in it. You know, that's, that's one thing that we actually do inside of our company where we work with people one-on-one -on -one is that, you know, a lot of times people will hire us because they'll say, well, First off, where do I find the money to invest or how do I, which money do I use and how do I use it? And then secondly, who can I go and talk to, right? Who are those people that maybe you've used, Chris? And, uh, and I've created a whole community that I've done over the time with that. So, so that's, that's really the other way. So either you do it yourself and you spend years doing it or you find a group where it's already been curated for you. That's great. So what is your definition of financial freedom? Financial freedom to me is when money is no longer the reason or excuse that you do or do not do anything. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, it has little to do with your bank account. It actually has more to do with what's going on up here, right? In your mind and, in, and as part of your being even. Because I'll tell you, I've had clients that have quote unquote gotten out of the rat race, meaning that they have more passive income to pay enough for their monthly bills. But if they haven't focused on their mindset, if they haven't got out of that saver mentality, for example, right? Where it's never enough. Still, even if they have enough passive income to retire from their work, it's not enough because they're still scared. You have to address that. So you have to address the mental you know, mindset aspect, and you got to address the strategy as well. And that's what we always try to focus on is that one-two punch. How do you deal with the mindset and the principles along with the strategies and make them work together so that you're truly free where money does, isn't the thing that controls you, you control it. Right. So you have a sign behind you that says, live your life now, not tomorrow. So what do you mean by that? Is this sort of the same thing? I mean, take your money and spend it now. Don't save it all for tomorrow. What, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it means blow it all on credit cards, right? Just, <laughs> just live, live la vida loca, you know? <laughs> no, not all. It's, 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 <laughs> right. well it's we had it's champagne kinda, for breakfast <laughs> <laughs> some people do you know if that brings you joy great you know um, and that's a, that's kind of what it means right when you do spend money spend on things that do bring you joy the other things get rid of it right i mean i actually am all about being lean and being liquid with your money having more enough money on the side but uh but still don't don't make someday your excuse don't say that someday I'll be free. Someday I'll go spend that time with my kids, right? Because, you know, I've got eight children between my wife and I. We have a blended family. It's like a Brady Bunch, but we fired Alice because there's no room for her. <laughs> but, uh, you know, with our eight kids, like by the time they get to be teenagers, they're already starting to have lives of their own. You know, if we had just kept saying, well, someday, 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 those experiences would be gone. That time is gone. And that's what happened to my dad. Now, my dad was always someday, someday, I'll just got to save enough. Well, I mean, he's now 79 years old. He's outlived the statistics. The guy is so stubborn, he will not die. You know, even though he's had, you know, multiple heart attacks and strokes, the guy just keeps on going. 
-hmm. But the problem is now he's bed bound. He can't yeah. get out of bed. He can't really do anything anymore. He, he, he would just love to go fishing and he can't even do that. And I remember talking on the phone the other day and, and we were just chatting and I was just kind of matter of factly talking about the things going on in our lives and some of the travel and the, some of the things we we're doing. And he just paused me. He said, Chris, I don't even understand that life. Like that was never my life. He's like, I'm, I'm proud of you because I wish that I could have done that. If I could have gone back in the time machine, I wish I would have done what you had done. And that's, and that's really what it's about. It's about creating that freedom and living your life now, because we don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. We don't even know if we'll be alive tomorrow. Let's hope we are. But, uh, but the truth is, is that, you know, we don't know. And so the best thing to do is to have that right balance, you know, live that life now, still plan for your future, create that future, but create it today. Don't put it away for someday. Well, that sounds like, you know, great advice. And right. really, I think, you know, what we are about here at Passage to Profit is really uh, encouraging people to take some some risks. Uh, you don't have to quit your job. You can always do a side hustle, but mm -hmm. uh, try to experiment with these things and broaden your, broaden your horizon a little bit. And if you have an idea or you have something that you want to do, you should try it and see what happens. You may learn that you don't like the business world, the entrepreneur world, and it, then at least you know, right? But if you, uh, if you never try and you always wanted to, uh, I think a lot of people would regret that. So um, creating that life for yourself and finding the right kind of fulfillment through work, doing things that you really want to do instead of things you have to do, I think is, 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 a, is a great way to Right. And I grew up with the mindset that you had to have a job. And of course, money was always scarce and everything. And you could either make money or you could be home with your kids as a woman. Now, this was things are so different today. I'm so happy about that. But the, the fact of the matter is you can be home with your kids and make money at the same time. And that is so important because I'm not saying you have to homeschool your children. You can do that if you want. But just to be there when they get home from school or help with their school activities or whatever, but also make money at the same time. I think that is the best way to live a life if you can do that. And it sounds like that's what you and your wife are doing, right? Exactly. It's, it's really just creating a new life, new experiences, creating really a, a new legacy, right? Something different to pass on than that scarcity like we were. I mean, I was a latchkey kid, right? I was the generation X that was ignored, that parents did have that battle between, do I have a career or do I take care of my kids? but it was more the me generation, you know, and, and now that's not the case. You know, there's a lot of us that said, no, we don't want that. Now we don't want a helicopter parent our kids necessarily. Right. But, but we do want to be able to give them a better opportunity to be able to choose the life that they want to choose. That's uh, and, and I think that's a really positive development. And, you know, yeah. one, one of the, maybe one of the few benefits of the COVID, uh, uh, pandemic has been now the realization that people can work from home more. And um, there are certainly advantages and disadvantages to that. That gives people now flexibility to be at home and around family and still, you know, do meaningful, do meaningful work. And so I think, you know, at least that's one positive that's come from it. Totally um, agree. Turning back to investments, I just wanted to ask, how do you know if this investment is a good investment or not? So, uh, how, you know, you talk about getting involved in a turnkey real estate deal. How do you vet that? How do you make sure that that is, is uh, you, you know, how, what kind of diligence do you do to make sure that that is a good investment for you? Well, the first thing is, if you're asking the question, is this a good investment? Then the answer is no, because <laughs> it means you're not comfortable <laughs> enough. You don't know enough at that point, right? So right. that's a great question to ask. Um, other question to ask too, is really just, like you said, like really understanding you mentioned, like, is there a risk or not? There's always risk. Never let anybody tell you it's risk-free. If so, that's when, you know, it's pro they're probably just selling you, not really giving you a good offering. But, uh, that being said, I like controlling my risk because just as a business owner, right? The reason I invest in my business and not in the stock market, why would I invest in somebody else's business like Tesla or Apple when I would invest in my own and control that rate of return? Same thing here is that I like to control my risk. So even like if I get a rental, for example, and I have somebody else manage it for me, well, somebody else managing it for me actually lessens my risk because I'm a horrible property manager. I'd rather have the professional do that. But that being said, they better be good. And so you have to research them, check out reviews on that company as well. Like I said, sometimes these companies provide them for you, 
but it's always it's not always a bad idea to look look at that look at worst case scenarios what possibly could go wrong you know um i always look at what's the absolute worst case i know that you know if i have a rental for example you know there's could be maintenance issues are there ways to minimize that yes i have a home inspection report at the beginning you know can i make sure the home inspection is good and solid so that it's rent ready and i have to do all the repairs right when i get in um, can I also make sure that there's good tenants, which again, comes back to a good property manager that can, I mean, I have properties like I have one in Memphis for five years, same tenant. I don't even know their name because I don't deal with them. Right. But I love the fact they keep paying. I have another property in North Carolina near Fort Bragg, Fort Bragg, you know, great property, same thing. You know, like I, I don't even know if there's the same renter or not, because again, they just do such a good job. It minimizes my risk, you know? So in fact, I don't even worry about you know, people worry about the recession, about the values tanking. I don't worry about that because for me, it's all about the profit inside those properties, right? Do I have enough cash flow coming in beyond the mortgage payments and the property management fees and everything else that still covers my payment and then some? So I'm always looking at for the worst case. You know, it's kind of that Reagan philosophy of, of trust, but verify. Uh, and that's the same thing you should be doing as well. No, I, it sounds like a, a great approach. And um, yeah, I think you have a, a, a great approach and a great message for our, our audience. How can people find you uh, after the show? Yeah, very easy. You can go to moneyripples.com. There's a lot of information, free information on that. Um, you can even check out our podcast, the Money Ripples podcast you mentioned at the beginning of this interview too. Well, that's great. Thanks for joining us. That's Chris Miles, who is the cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor. We'll be back with more Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt right after this. So welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. And uh, this show, we're focusing a little bit on patents. So at the uh, beginning of the program, we did IP in the news, and we talked about an Apple patent. And if you're interested in learning more about patents, go to our landing page at learnmoreaboutpatents.com. We've got free content for you to download there very informative information about patents. And if you need intellectual property for your business, uh, I definitely recommend that you uh, check it out. And, and you can contact Richard for a free consultation. And you can contact me for a free consultation. So so he's been doing this stuff for a long time. I have <laughs> we'll been doing this for a, a, a long time. Figuring out sticky problems and also helping people that are just starting out. Well, so. thank you. I really appreciate those kind words. And now it's time for Elizabeth's um, segment, and she's going to be talking about the uh, projects she's working on, Elizabeth's segment. <laughs> All right. Or so as I said at the beginning of the show, I do marketing at Gearheart Law. So we had a milestone, something that has never happened for us before. We're very pleased that we hired a company called Firm Pilot. And they use artificial intelligence to help us with our website search engine optimization and to help us with blogs, which, of course, then I have to go through and make sure that everything's right. Because if you're using artificial intelligence for stuff like this, you know that you always have to go fix it. Anyway, uh, they managed with one of our blogs particularly to get us a snippet on Google. So I had no idea what it a snippet painful, was. sounds painful, but it's really a good thing. <laughs> so if you're... A, a snippet is if somebody's searching on Google and a lot of times you'll see a box come up if you ask a question and in that box will be your question. For us, it was like, what is consumer products patent? And there'll be like some answers to it. And then the website of the place that gave the answer. So we got one of those first time ever. Yay. Woo. So thank you for Pilot AI. <laughs> <laughs> your, heart, your heart law. And Triumph. I so. I guess so. If you type in consumer product patent, you'll you'll see our little snippet there, and um, yeah. and so hopefully there's there's even more information about patents there. But what right. about you? What's been going on with your projects? So I have a couple of projects. I guess I'll talk about Jersey Podcasts first. So I have a podcast called the Jersey Podcasts podcast with Danielle Woolley, where we interview people and we talk about cats issues with cats right now it's a big thing because it's summertime and there are zillion kittens and all sorts of things and rescues and fostering and all sorts of stuff so we talk about everything cats and the funny strange things they do which are pretty much endless with cats <laughs> <laughs> and uh and we as i said we have other people come on the show so we're having a good time with that so that's a podcast anywhere you find your podcasts um, my and name, that's the Jersey Podcasts. 
podcast. Yes, the Jersey okay. say that real fast. So. And and what is what is like jerseypodcast.com? Do you have a yes, jerseypodcast.com. We have a website that I'll send you everywhere. So my main project though, besides Gear Heart Law, is Blue Streak Directory. It's a online directory, video directory of B2B businesses. So I've been building the website for a while. The landing page should be done by the time this comes out. What it is, is every B2B business owner should have a 30 second pitch, right? So you record your 30 second pitch and you put it on this website. And I encourage people to have a strong tagline and I'll have categories. I'm starting out with uh, business coaches and marketing agencies or marketing people because over COVID, I did longer interviews with people for the precursor to this, which was called Fireside. And what I found was the people that are most willing or eager to do this are going to be the business coaches and the marketing people because they understand the importance of video. And so I'm starting to build it again. But during COVID, I use long video. This is going to be 30 second video, short video, 30 seconds to a minute. So short video. So if it's like Angie's list only, I don't ask an people any questions that are coming to the site you just you pull up the site you can scroll through 10 videos and listen for a few seconds to and decide if there's somebody there you want to work with so i'm pretty excited about that the website's coming soon and uh that's gonna be all good things a lot of yeah good so things. i do have one other thing i'm working on that i'm not going to talk about right now it's a purely fun project but i do think it can give me some income so Passive keep, income, maybe. Passive income. So I'm going to keep it under wraps. Well, I, anyway, yeah, I'm going to keep it under wraps till I do the launch. So, okay. Ooh, big secret. So, so now oh, we get to move on to our other two presenters. So, our next one is Anne McKittrick. And I'm excited to hear what she has to say because I'm supposed to be a grandma and knock on wood if everything goes well. <laughs> and I probably need some of this advice for that. But she is a child care expert and she's got. Uh, parenting in the first three years podcast she taught child development to, in college to college students and knows a lot about child care that could really help the rest of us so welcome Anne. thank you so great to be here thank yeah you. so give us a give us a scoop on what you're doing okay well you know i am um, i'm in the uh, third half of my life and doing this career uh, as an entrepreneur after um, many years of working with teachers of young children, training them to be teachers, and also working with young children and their parents in a variety of different capacities. And um, but I, the bottom line is, I really, really love little kids, and I love explaining them to people. And um, so whether that's a teacher I'm explaining it to or to a parent, um, I love to just watch their eyes open wide and say, oh, that's why that's happening. And that's why it's triggering me in this way. And, um, and just love to problem solve with them. And so um, when I resigned from my job here at a local university here in, in Houston area, um, I started a website of a catalog of courses for early childhood teachers. They are the online courses, the continuing ed de development that they need each year. And um, so I kind of jumped into this whole entrepreneur thing, uh, two feet first and, and learned as I went along. And so I've loved to hear all of the things that you've um, said, because it's, it's been very much my experience and I'll, I'd love to talk more about that. But then, um, so I had this website with these courses, it was called Texas Child Care Training. And then my daughter and I, we were going to start, um, a mommy blog. And this was about eight years ago and mommy blogs were a thing and she was going to try to monetize it. She had just had a baby and it was just going to be kind of something we did together, sort of parallel paths, but I was going to support her in it. And she did a beautiful job. She created this sweet little website called Nurtured Noggins and she wrote some beautiful blogs. She's an educator herself and um, with lots of insight, um, did a great job. After a couple of years, she said, you know, mom, um, it's really hard to make money doing this and I'm kind of not wanting to do it anymore. So I, I, I'm, I went out and I said, amen, sister, I get you. But, you know, um, I, I love the name nurtured noggins. And I said, I'm just going to hang on to that URL. And so I let her website sit there and 
be ignored for about a year and a half. Came time to pay the URL fee. I thought, oh, I'll just go look and see what's going on. Well, she had gone viral and had was getting tens of thousands of clicks every month on um, wow. a blog post entitled Zero, How to Play with Your Zero to Three-Month-Old. And then the next one, next most popular, how do you play with your three to six month old? Next one, activities for six to nine month olds. And I just thought, well, golly, I think there's a bunch of new parents out there that really are not quite sure what to do with their babies. And that's what I love. And so I just kind of pivoted my attention over towards Nurture Doggins, rebuilt the site. And I've tried a lot of different ways to communicate this uh, this passion and this, you know, this understanding to people through, you know, blogs and videos and now my podcast and, and now I've got some other things going on. So that's kind of in a nutshell, what I do and uh, how it came about. Wow. How do you play with the zero to three? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, now, I'm at, now I'm asking myself, I wonder if I did the right things. Maybe the video games were a little early, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I need to figure well, that out because my wife is expecting and we're, we're doing October. Yay! So I will be going to that website. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, you know, a zero to three month old, they're calling this the uh, fourth trimester. This is really when the baby's getting used to the world around them. And so there's not a lot of play happening. Mostly it's just being responsive to any cue that they give you. Lots of face-to-face -face contact, letting them see you, smell you, all of those things, and um, just making sure that they are cared for and seen and responded to. Responsiveness is the the big word for for that period of time. But any anything, you know, you can go read that blog post. She's got great ideas. Taking a walk outside, doing swings and things like that, just to to stimulate their various things in their brain. What about? years ago, the knowledge, oh, well, you should play classical music for your new baby all the time, and then they'll be better at math. What do you think about that? I don't think there's a thing in the world wrong with playing classical music for your baby. I think it's very, um, very good for the brain. Not all the time, but every now and again, I think it's a really great thing. Um, music stimulates parts of the brain that, that, um, that are, you know, not used all the time. And so with babies, what we see oftentimes is a calmness that comes over and, and, um, and they do really respond to it. They really respond well to your singing, whether or not you sing any good or not. They just love it when you sing. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Well, no, I did play classical music and my son is really good at math, but I don't know if the two are related. Right. Well, you're really good at math, but I, I does it, does it matter what kind of music it is or does it, is it, really classical music in particular I, I, or, or could you play other types oh I think you can play whatever music you want for your children I mean as a mama myself I would say you know good lyrics not explicit lyrics for your young children but um whatever is culturally relevant in your home is what is going to be important to your child I do think that there are um, <laughs> tempos to music that can raise a level of activity. And oftentimes, if you want to lower the level of activity, if you lower the tempo and lower the volume, you're going to see some response with the child. But um, yeah, but yeah well, for sure. One thing I really like about what you have here in our description of what you do is one topic of discussion is ways to maintain a strong connection with your young children, even when you have to work Monday through Friday and someone else is taking care of them. So that's hard for a lot of people. I think it was hard for, for sure. me when I had to work when my kids were little. I hated it being mm -hmm. away from them. I liked working, but I didn't like being away from them. So how do you mm -hmm. maintain that? You know, I was an infant teacher for, you know, a, a period of time. And so I had a lot of experience talking with parents about during this drop-off time, I mean, it's grievous, especially when they're so tiny and you're just starting in childcare. Um, I think that the main thing to remember um, as a parent is that your child will, you will never be replaced. You will always be the primary attachment figure for your child. You want them to be attached to their caregiver throughout the day. You want that attachment to happen. Um but you'll, you will always win when it comes to relationship. Even if your toddler, you hear your toddler calling that teacher mama, um, that doesn't mean anything except that 
that's where they are in their language development. Um, and so I think that's really the important thing, but also just to know that, um, that the time when you drop off and when you pick up, that's a very um, precious time and to allow yourself some space in your head and physically to, to linger there, especially with the drop-off. If you can linger at the drop-off, I think that's really good. And yeah. So what are some of the worst things you can do? The worst things? Not trust your caregiver. You oh. know, um, I think that the, the worst thing that you can do is feel uncomfortable with who you have left your child with, because then you never feel settled or at peace while you're apart. And, um, and so it's really important to find a person that, um, that you trust, you know, that you, that you feel right about. And if you don't feel right, if like, if you start a child in a situation and then you begin to feel some questions, follow that, you know, your intuition is there for a really good reason. Yeah. I ended up having to quit work because we couldn't find the right people to take care mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. kids. And I didn't really want to quit, but I just felt like the kids were more important. And we just, we gave up stuff that other people had, but mm -hmm. we figured the experience with the kids. And, you know, if I had known Chris back then, <laughs> <laughs> we figured out some way to make money being home with the kids, right. which is what people are doing now. Right. But now yeah. I agree with you a hundred percent. And I actually had a friend that videotaped somebody or not videotaped. I think she had some sort of tape recorder. This is a long time ago. And she found the woman was not being nice to her kid in her house and she confronted her and fired her mm -hmm. and had to find an alternative that that is really, I, I agree with you. That's the most important thing. Right. And you know, you, you mentioned this earlier that used to be people had to make the choice either work or parent their child full time. And today we just live in this marvelous time where you can do, you can do both, you know, you can work from home and, and have your child at home. Maybe you have somebody that comes in and, you know, cares for them, but you are together. You can take a break and go nurse your baby or, you know, do all of the things that you want to do with your child and not be separated like that. I actually work with a lot of moms and I'm, you know, getting ready to launch a, a group on helping moms figure that out, how they can do that very thing. Well, that brings us right to Chris. Chris, do you have any comments or questions? Yeah. A question that's come up in my head is, you know, we always, always hear those wives tales over the years, right? Uh, what's a common myth that young mothers are getting maybe from their own moms that isn't necessarily true? Hmm. I, you know, I think there's a lot of thing that's a lot of things that have kind of been, um, discovered in child development over the last 20 years. And so those of us who are grandmas, I'm a Mimi of three. And um, the things that pediatricians are telling uh, new parents today is different from what we were told when, when we had our babies. And then for me, take it back another 10, 12 years before I ever had children, I was doing this work. And um, I think that, gosh, one, one thing does not come to mind. The only, the thing that does, that's fresh on my mind is because I've, I've recently done a presentation on this. It's just the, the effect of social media on the way parents feel about what, how they are parenting. And I think that there's these voices that tell us, you know, you've got to be doing it this way. You've got to be doing it this way, depending on who you listen to and what you do, all that stuff. And those voices are just being played in your mind all the time. And so you're constantly measuring yourself up against this thing. You know, it's almost intangible, right? Because it's just something you're scrolling through on your phone, but it's affecting you deeply in your own feelings about yourself as a parent. And um, I think that's, that's one of the myths is that there's a right and wrong way to do everything. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> Go all over the world. We all parent different and people grow up to be beautiful adults, you know? Yeah. So that's a, kind of a, one of the things that was sort of uh, uh, prevalent, a question that was prevalent uh, a long time ago was uh, 
quantity of parenting time versus quality of parenting time. And can you talk a little bit about that and how it affects the development of children? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, there is um, there is a real misunderstanding about quantity and quality. Quality is extremely important. Quantity matters too, you know? <laughs> it does matter to be in the same room and present with your with your young children as they play and versus not. And, um, and so mostly we just need to be um, top of mind that when we are with our children, we need to be responsive to them and paying attention to and them, watching their cues and responsive. And then, you know, as much as you can, but the quality, the quantity of that time if it's short, that's perfectly fine. If it's good, solid time with them. I mean, with eight children, I can only imagine what it's like to make sure that you have time with each one of your children individually, because they need that. They need our full attention for short periods of time, but it doesn't take that long to fill up a little tank, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. you know? And really? so just, I think it's really, you just have to watch your children, observe them closely and make sure that they are getting what they need and that you also are getting what you need. Yeah. And I feel like that you're coming from a real place of love for children with this advice. This is great advice. And I know this show is about entrepreneurism and Richard had mentioned before the show, we want to ask you kind of how you were able to grow this into something that you could use to support yourself with uh, as an entrepreneur, how could you make a business out of this and make it successful? Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting because um, the Texas Child Care Training uh, Company is my passive income. I probably give it very, very little time. And every week, you know, I, I bring in a pretty good amount of money. That's where my revenue is coming in. And um, with Nurtured Noggins, I'm just beginning to launch programs of parent coaching and um, this momentum group for moms where it's, it's, it's beyond coaching. It's really around connections and um, figuring out how can you be 100% mom and 100% woman? <laughs> because there's this funny thing that happens with women. We lose ourselves a little bit when we have children. And, um, and if you can't tap into that you, <laughs> then... It, it can really, it can really feel kind of bad after a little while because you, you know, it's, it's a funny balance. It's just a really interesting balance. And so we are going to explore that together over dinner with a glass of wine. And we are going to just really look at all of that in a very close way and build community so that all these moms have somebody to talk to, you know, and wow. also we're going to really try to build some little entrepreneurs in this thing too. Awesome. <laughs> I will certainly tell my daughter-in-law about that. Uh, we are, I, I could talk to you about child stuff all day, but unfortunately we have to go end this segment, but how can people find you? What's the best way to get in touch? I think the best way is Nurtured Noggins. And you can go to uh, Nurtured Noggins, Facebook, Instagram, and message me there or nurturednoggins.com. And that's the website and you can get a hold of me there. Excellent. Well, thank you. Ann thank McKittrick you. with nurtured noggins yeah, so if you have a, a a young noggin that needs nurturing you know where to what go. we do yeah <laughs> so now we're on to something a little different but i don't know along the same lines with this passive income but this kind of seems like the passive income show so <laughs> we have john york with frequency people app and he is helping people monetize on their own hubs like podcasters influencers and it was probably only a matter of time before people said, I'm sick of paying Apple this high commission. Uh, let me find something else. So John, can you please describe your company and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Frequency People is a platform. We're on Android, iOS. Uh, we have a web app or website where you can log in as well. But we allow our users to come in and create and join public or private, free and or paid networks or we call it communities essentially um, and sub communities so that they can interact with people who have the same interests as they do. Um, so 
I, I ended up getting the idea for this by I, I was at a high school basketball game watching a kid that I mentored play and he ended up getting a technical foul for apologizing to the ref. Now, if you're a sports fan, you can understand the frustration that you feel in that moment to see a call that is not justified by anything take place. And so I really wanted to rant about it in that moment. I wanted to talk about it on social media <laughs> like we all do. And I realized after pulling my phone out and starting to type my message that um, nobody who followed me would actually was was at that game. And so even if I did put the message out there, nobody would fully understand what I was feeling in that moment. And so I wanted to create a platform where people could have contextual conversation with others who care about the same things that they do, not necessarily um, on the same side as them, but are just as passionate about it as they are. And so that was the genesis of the company. And as time went on, we realized, hey, this is an opportunity that we have right now because um, we're looking at how social media, what it's doing, how it's taking place, the lack of trust that's coming in, the lack of control that people have as well. And so we wanted to turn this platform into something that goes beyond sports, but um, goes into all of areas of interest for podcasters, influencers, um, brands and organizations, and they could come in there, create their communities. Um, and, and we have sub communities as well, so they can break it out um, and really engage with their users, their followers, their consumers at a much more intimate level by going deeper than a comment and, and tapping into the conversation. And so we built this platform that allows users to do that. But on the control side, now we allow you to basically have your own version of our app, but it's hosted in our app so that you can build your own ecosystem and have a social media platform hosted inside of our app that's geared towards the way that you actually want to interact and engage on social media. Um, so we're all about just control and power and giving it back to the people. Oh, that's really great. So. Uh, so, for example, if you had uh, uh, a high school soccer team, you could have all of the parents and the kids uh, create a community for that. And then maybe when they're at the games, something happens or uh, people can comment, you know, back and forth. Uh, maybe even if the coach signs up, you can talk, you know, telling the coach how to how to coach the game. Um, but you could you could you you can have that community of people who have similar interests. Is that the, basically the idea, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you can have that community of people, but then you can have sub communities underneath it. So, to your example, um, every team could have a higher level community, and all of the parents and their kids could be in there. Um, but then they could have sub communities, one for the parents specifically one for the, the their kids specifically and the coaches and another one just for that coaching staff. And they don't have really inter any interaction, but they're all hosted underneath the umbrella of their overarching one. So we allow you to have that control um, at the level that makes sense for you. And I mean, we all interact based off of the, the similarities that we have. We're on the show together talking about entrepreneurship because we have a passion and a similarity for what's going on. Our goal is to replicate that in the social space and allow there to be more engaging conversations that take place. Excellent. Chris, did you have a question or comment? Yeah, I think this is very trending because the last few years we've seen that social media companies, it's harder and harder to trust them, right? Because mm -hmm. if you try to have a Facebook group set up, for example, to do this, what if all of a sudden they change the rules? What if they start charging for Facebook? What if they shut down that community because they didn't like something that was said or, you know, and then you have to go through that whole runaround. Uh, I say this is a big answer. So I guess my question for you is, do you see this as being like a solution to kind of get people more in control away from social media where they have that ability to control their own group? Yeah, I do. Um, of course, we have our policies where we're not going to like, you know, hate groups and things like that. That's never, we're not going to allow that. But I mean, if you have a, a, an opinion that may not be popular, but it's not, you know, illegal or anything like that or immoral, go on there and 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 have your conversation with your people. Our goal is not to um, control your voice, right? We want you to have your voice, to speak your voice and to speak it with other people um, who care about the same things that you or at least passionate about the same things that you are. Um, you know, we, we don't want to replicate what's been done in the past with other social media platforms. There is a level of protection that, of course, we're constantly thinking through to ensure that our users are safe and protected and nothing illicit or explicit is taking place in there. 
Um, but as much as possible, our goal is to put the control and the power back into your hands. So these platforms are completely independent of Facebook or uh, Instagram or any other uh, platforms that are, are popular. Uh, is there any kind of way to connect with the larger groups or is, uh, you know, like a Facebook group or something like that? Or are you uh, focused just on the, the members in your community and the technology works only for them? So right now our technology is within our platform. So if you want to bring your, let's say you have a Facebook community, um, you got a thousand people. The hardest thing to do is to get people to move to a new platform and, and to ask them to do it, right? Um, we've, we're trying to make that easier for people. So if you have their email addresses, you can actually send us that information and we can bulk load them in to kind of ease that process a little bit. So all you have to do is you can send us even a custom email. We'll send a, a custom email out on your behalf to your people to say, hey, you already have an account created. I just need you to click on the link and you're already in there. Um, and so it'll take them directly to your network, to your community, and they're immediately in there. But again, our goal is to, you know, we can't really have that control if we're fully integrated with these other technologies, right? Um, and so we, you would have to come over to our platform and we're doing all that we can to make it as easy as possible. You have a dedicated link that you can share anywhere and anybody can click on it and it'll, again, take them directly to your platform or, I mean, to your community. Or if you have their information, you can send it to us and we'll actually upload it all in there, create the accounts for them using their email address and you know, a, a temporary password, all they have to do is actually just click on the link and log in. Well, I can really see the value of this because for instance, for the Jersey podcasts, we have a private Facebook group because there are so many people out there that are so nasty about cats and animals in general, et cetera, that we didn't yeah. want to just open it up to the whole Facebook community. So this is, but we do have, when you were talking about people who have differing views on things, we do have one um, episode that we do repeatedly every so often that people just love and it's cats versus dogs. And we have people come on <laughs> and talk about why cats are better, why dogs are better. And it just reminded me of that when you were talking about people could have opposing views yeah, and, yeah. and be in a safe place to share. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'll say a few things on that. Um, first, I grew up, uh, my parents bought us two cats and those cats continue to replicate. Um, to where <laughs> it, we had 13 yeah, cats at one cats. time. Yeah. Yeah. We had 13. And so wow. at this point I'm, I'm all catted out. So now I just stick to my, my standard poodle Monty and, and he does it for us. But uh, to that point though, one of the things that we also provide is um, again, it's all about control. We want you to be able to control the moderation of your platform of your community as well. And so, whereas these other tools that moderation takes place at the higher level platform, like the, the owners, like Mark Zuckerberg and his team, we allow you to use our AI technology and you can actually set a moderation threshold um, for your particular community. And so if it hits a threshold, it'll be flagged. And if it goes beyond another threshold, then it'll be automatically blocked on your behalf. So you don't even have to worry about that. You can always go back and yes. review the messages, but we, again, it's control for us. We wanna make sure that you have control. Well, that would make it a lot easier to grow the platform, quite honestly, because like growing this private Facebook group is kind of hard. But if it was on a platform like yours, I think it'd be easier to grow because you would have that moderation factor. So you could let everybody in and then it would block out the ones that were bad. Absolutely. Yes. So, John, what are the target markets for your technology? Are you you have specific groups in mind that you want to sign up first? Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty of our technology is it's wide open, right? As long as you have a group of people who are interested in the same things you are, you can come to the platform. In terms of where we're starting off, we're looking at sports and entertainment. We're looking at, um, that includes music. Uh, we have a few music labels who are in the process of signing up now. Um, we're looking at nonprofit organizations such as churches who, uh, who could utilize the technology to have better integrated communication with their teams as well as their congregations um, or their, their consumers and followers. Um, but yeah, so we're really focusing on, on those particular areas. But at this point, anybody can come in and create an account. Um, it's free to create. If you do want to charge for access to your community, you can do one-time fees or recurring fees, monthly fees for to access your community. You can do that. Um, that there's a, you know, again, we 
take 20%, you guys keep 80% of that, which is cheaper than what Google and Apple would take. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it's it's wide open, but our main focus right now is sports and entertainment, nonprofit organizations. Excellent. Chris, do you have another comment or question? Yeah, I I think it's interesting because I actually just set up a community for my own my own clients as well, because I know it's hard to believe, but sometimes my clients kind of get tired of hearing me. And so <laughs> it's nice to have that community where you can have them talk to each other and yeah. ask questions of each other too. So I know from a business standpoint, even that's something that's very valuable, especially where I, I'm not worried about, you know, would Facebook just get rid of this, you know, particular feature at some point, you know, or something that I know it's private that they can discuss things amongst themselves and not, you know, have outside moderation, you know, where I can moderate it personally. So I know from a business standpoint, I think it's a, a great thing. And and I see more and more, we're tending more towards a community-based culture. Mm -hmm. And so I yeah. think this is a uh, very timely. I, I appreciate agree. that. Yeah, yeah I you. agree. I think that with COVID, we realized how important community was. And I think since COVID, everybody is really like, I need a community and they needed it then too. But I think it really brought us back to remembering that. And this is right on target with that. Yeah, I mean, one of the advantages of technology now is that if you want to be part of a community because you have special interests, it is generally easier now to find communities, people who share those interests. Before you kind of had to stumble across them, right? Or you had to just kind of stumble across people who were excited about the same things that you're excited. But now I think um, the technology and the culture is evolving so that these things are a lot more accessible. And um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing. So um, kudos to John. So John, where can uh, people find out more about frequency, the frequency people app? Yeah, you can head to our website, frequencypeople.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, our handle is at frequency people. And then, you know, my personal handle, if you have any particular individual questions you want to ask there is at John C. York. Excellent. Well, thank you. Listeners, you are listening to Passage to Profit, the road to entrepreneurship with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart, our special guest today, Chris Miles. We are coming to the end of our show. We're not quite done yet, so don't go away. But this has just been a fabulous show with, I, I just, the creativity, the knowledge, the everything. And really, we've been all about passive income today. So <laughs> that's something everybody wants, right? And, but, and if you have missed parts of the show or you want to listen to it again, our podcast will be available tomorrow uh, on all the places that you get your podcast. Uh, and that's Passage to Profit Show. Uh, check us out and you can uh, take us with you wherever you go. We'll be right back. Ever since I was a kid, my vocabulary score was always top notch. That was before a lot of words began to change their meaning. Transparency is now a human thing. It refers to your absolute clarity and the expression of all of your knowledge and intentions. I only wish some of my reading lenses could be quite so honest. Platforms were the agendas you would discuss. Now, platforms are the medium you seek out to discuss those agendas. Virtual was a quality we held to when we had to deal with reality. Now, the reality is mostly virtual, and we don't have to be. When I was a kid, I always had my head in the clouds, and that's why I could never find anything. Now, we store all the important stuff in the cloud, and we keep our heads down here on Earth, where they belong. I'm not so sure the verbal portion of the SAT exam prepared me for all this when I was younger, but I didn't do too badly on the score. I could be transparent and share my score with you, but given what it was, I think we'll just keep that information virtual. Well, it's been an absolutely amazing show. I have been so jazzed by all of the information that I gained today, uh, everything from uh, passive income and better investing to better parenting to better community. So uh, it's been really educational for me. And now it's time for my favorite part of the show, which is Elizabeth's question. So every week, Elizabeth that's has a question that she asks. Well, that's because you're my favorite person. Oh, thank you. So what is the question today? So I want to ask our guests, what drives you? So I'm going to start with Chris Miles. Chris, what drives you to do what you're doing? Yeah, I get that a lot because people say, well, why are you working? <laughs> you know, why are you working when you don't have to? 
And the thing that drives me is that I realize that our lives are meant more than just to survive, pay bills, just take care of our family and our needs, right? And I remember before I named the company Money Ripples, this is about 11, almost 12 years ago, I was out for a jog trying to come up with a company name. And I went to the vision of, of the people I'd already helped up to that point. And I remember there was a couple, they were out in, in North Dakota. They were, uh, the, the husband was a chiropractor. He was working six days a week sometimes and had no energy at the end of the week for his family. And when we first met, we started to look at ways to be creative with his finances and we were able to free up $6,000 a month out of his life. And as a result, he was able to take off the weekends now, right? Mm. And the very first thing they bought with that 6,000 bucks was a four-wheeler. Ah. And with that, that four-wheeler, of course, you think you know most people would condemn them, right? Judge them, like, how dare you blow that money? But his wife said, no, you don't understand, Chris. Like that $6,000 on that four-wheeler was the best investment we could have made because my kids now have their dad back and I have my husband back. He has energy to play with us and to do things with us so that we're going every weekend riding on that four-wheeler together, creating new memories. And my kids get to see a different example of a father than, than what they were getting before. And that's when the, the, that ripple effect I was starting to see from the family that could create the community across the world. That's why I named the company Money Ripples. And that's what really drives me. It's really about how to liberate people. Because I think that if I've been so blessed on this planet, what can I do to be able to create a ripple effect in other people's lives? And that's what keeps me going day in and day out to keep teaching and keep spreading this message to create more freedom and prosperity for people. Excellent. Wow. So, Anne McKittrick, what drives you? You know, that's such a great question. And I, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of ebb and flow, right? And your energy, but what always brings me energy and what drives me is helping people understand how to respond to their kids in a way that is, will meet their kid where they are, but also to understand why they are responding the way that they are by understanding themselves and in their own development as a parent and their own development as an, as a person and just all of those things. And so that if we, if we understand why the kid's doing what they're doing and why we're responding the way that we are, then it just makes for a more peaceful existence with one another. And we're not expecting kids to do things that they can't do. And we're not expecting ourselves to be more than we can be as just this human being who's trying to raise these children. And so I love helping moms, especially figure this out because there's such a, there's such a, an, a thing inside of us that, that happens. And, um, and I love, I love helping moms with that. I love doing the, the work that I do. Yeah, and it takes more than just a good glass of wine to get through it. <laughs> yes, it does. It takes a lot. Excellent. So John York, John C. York, what drives <laughs> you? What what motivates you? Oh man, that's um that's a fun question. Um for me, I want to I want to live my life with my hands wide open, not holding on to anything that was meant for me to let go of and, and put in the world. Um and I believe that entrepreneurship is something that, you know, is deeply ingrained within me. And if I don't pursue it, I'm not, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And so for me, I want to live that open type of life. And I also want to help others and show others how they can do the same as well. Um, and so that that's really important to me just to, to be that example as well. Um, Cause you know, as, as Chris was talking about it, it's the ripple effect, right? I believe that once you're able to do that and pursue the things that you're passionate about um, and what your purpose to do, that is where you can have that freedom and, and that freedom brings choice. And when you have that choice, then you're able to really do everything that you want to do and truly enjoy life. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I want to have the choice to work. I don't want to have to work. I, you know, I don't want to need to work. Right. I want to be able to choose to if I if that's what I want to do. So that's really it for me. It's just wide open. Excellent. Richard Gerhart, owner of Gerhart Law. What so drives the you? question wasn't what drives me crazy, right? No. <laughs> I no, I would say though that what drives me is challenge. I really love a good challenge and I love the feeling that I have when uh, I feel like I'm meeting the challenge. Uh, I love solving problems, legal problems for our, our clients and business problems. And so 
Uh, it's really the the challenges that that keeps it interesting. And then the byproduct of that, of course, is all the all the positive effects that come from um, solving those problems for people. And uh, that's what drives me. Excellent. So what drives me? I just have this undying urge to create every day. Um, and it's I've, I'm just driven to create. Yeah, and I'm I, not I, really can, sure. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not really sure exactly where that comes from, but I just love to create new things. I love innovative technologies, which is why I love this show. I'm an early adopter. I, I just love learning and creating. So that's what drives me. Great, great. That works best between the two of you as you create a challenge for him. <laughs> all the time i probably create more challenges for her she just <laughs> is too shy to admit it <laughs> i challenged him to start his own law firm and now look what happened <laughs> so, okay. so i guess it's time to wrap up right so we're gonna go run through everybody that was on the show again and how to get a hold of them so chris miles our guest cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor moneyripples.com is where you find him. Can you say passive income, children? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and speaking of children, Anne McKittrick, Nurtured Noggins. You can find her at nurturednoggins.com. And Noggins is N-O-G-G-I-N-S.com. So nurturednoggins.com. And boy, if you have questions about what to do with your kid, <laughs> she, she's got a lot of experience and knowledge and a lot of help. And building community too with other mothers nurture your kids noggin today yes and then if you want to build your own community and do it your way john york has frequency people app you can find him at frequencypeople.com and you can monetize on your own hub which is the overarching thing but you get control over your own community in a way that you can't have on other platforms so this is very cool yeah you get to hang out with people who are on your same frequency you do mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> i love it well anyway we have to wrap up now it's been another great episode of passage to profit and as a reminder our podcast is out tomorrow and if you have uh interest in patents or trademarks you can go to our landing pages patents learn more about patents.com as well as our website gearheartlaw.com and you can find out more about intellectual property and ways to protect your business before we go, I'd like to thank the whole Passage to Profit team and uh, Noah Fleischman, our producer, and Alicia Morrissey, our uh, program coordinator. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And while the information presented during this program is believed to be correct, never take a legal step without first checking with your legal professional. And for all your patent trademark needs, uh, visit gearheartlaw.com. That's it for us. We're signing off. We'll see you again next week on... Passage to Profit.